welcome to Talking Tropes. Today we're going to be talking about... Kids just being kids, running wild and running free. Kids just being kids. No, no. Hannah. What? No, oh, we're not kids. Man. We're adults. No, you're just a boring grown ups. adult man. I'm a kid and I don't play by the rules with a Z. Yeah, kids, kids with a Z rules... Also with the Z. Z. Yes. That's what we're talking about today. We're talking about a time, a magical time, a truly, a truly amazing time when kids used to rule. Totally. You know, so much of, I, I feel like media these days, it's just about like how weird and stupid can something be or like how like grown up can we like sneakily make it. But like. This is just pure childhood fantasy, and it's it's amazing. I love this trope. I didn't think well, I would love it as much as I do. <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad you enjoyed yourself. Um, I, it has only reinforced my belief that these films that we grew up on, that focused on the theme of kids rule and adults drool, have ruined us psychologically, and have created a society that is unsustainable. Okay, dramatic. Um, yes, this is the crazy pseudoscience episode of Talking Tropes, <laughs> where I talk about generational cultural identity. We're going to oh be talking boy. about millennials today, of which I am one of. I'm on the tail end. I'm one of the younger millennials. <laughs> I, I, I'd say I'm solidly millennial, but uh, I, I'm just going There are millennials who are older than you as well, though. But the yes. point is, in the in the in the late '90s and the early 2000s, very early 2000s, there was this phenomenon where all the kids' shows took on this strangely revolutionary tone. Yeah. Okay. But why are you saying it? It's ruined us then. <laughs> because what happens when the revolutionary kids who are awesome grow into that which they despise? I mean, the adults. It's, it's baby boomers, <laughs> like the 60s you know no 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 no. baby boomers grew up on tv that was entirely involved with you gotta you know grow up and raise a family they didn't have any subversive kids show sticking it to the adults and so they never associated rebelliousness with you know adulthood or with childhood childhood uh, all right maybe maybe um yeah interesting this is this is my my working theory so let's let's jump into some examples because i think i think where my tales really come into into truth is in the isn't in the (laughs) nitty-gritty yeah well okay it's interesting because i think at first glance you would think this is mostly like an animation trope um, but, but it really is kind of all I mean, over. that's not what I picture. When really? I think kids rule, I immediately think of, you know, I think of a particular style of camera work. I think of a particular color scheme in live action. I think of wide angle lenses on a shot of an adult, like making weird faces while getting kicked in the balls by a kid. Yeah. That's yeah. what I think of. Yeah, that's fair. That's. That's pretty fair. I don't know. For me, I um, the first thing that I always think of is, I guess, those TV shows that you were mentioning earlier, um, which in general tended to be, like, animated. Um, but uh, c- can we start with uh, Fairly Odd Parents schools out the musical? Because I feel like this <laughs> the, is just the The music most... that you started with apropos it... of nothing. <laughs> Yeah, that one. Um, just because I feel like it is by far the most like on the nose example of this trope <laughs> that you could ever hope to concoct, you know? So it's, yeah, so the villains in this one are the pixies, right? They're boring, bureaucratic fairies. But also the parents. Oh, and the parents are also the villains because they just want to send their kids away to depressing summer camps of learning. Right. And what safety. was it? Flappy Bob's Learnatorium? Yep. And everyone <laughs> wears like safety pads and the slides are only like a foot tall and, you know, the books are all rubber so no one gets a paper cut. Right. And I think what, what immediately shoots out to me about this one is how um, apolitical it is. You know, like, what is at stake here is the concept of 
fun. Right. Like, there is no, like, talking about, like, oh, is it ethical to send kids to camp versus having them play by themselves? No. Is there it's... a safety concern or whatever? It doesn't have anything this to do is, with that. It's literally entirely... just fun versus boring. Yeah, no, it's it's just entirely divorced from any actual reality. Um, and I think that's kind of what makes it so great, in right. my opinion. Because, um, like, the, the fucking pixies have a... 37 year evil plan <laughs> that involves turning a clown into a corporate lawyer who thinks boring is fun and fun is boring. Yeah, that's literally a quote from the movie. We t- trained him to think that boring was fun. <laughs> Which, like, doesn't even make sense if you take a second to think about it. It's just. Right. It's, and so, what, how does the plot, like, play out? Like, is it supposed to be, like, they're trying to make kids miserable enough that one of them wishes that kids rule the world? Oh, uh, no. So what they want is to take over fairy, fairy World, and there's, like, a weird loophole in the fairy rule book that says if pixies are the only magical creature left on Earth, then they get to rule it. Or, yeah, they get to, like, grant a wish. Um, and... You know, they've trained Flappy Bob, this fucking To wish clown. for the Pixies to be in charge of... This is so right. complicated. It's very, this is very complicated. insanely complex. It's so <laughs> bizarrely complex. So, in order to get to this place where this happens, they give the kids who just had out for summer vacation, like, crazy insane, like, toys to play with that are like monster trucks and chainsaws and like bears and so they're running wild through the town the adults are like fuck this they send them to camp timmy of course is like how dare they send us to camp this is terrible so he wishes that the kids were in charge and they are and then like the world is perfect and because the world's perfect they don't need fairies anymore so all the fairies get recalled and so it's just pixies left and then they get to take over the world and they do that for kids, a little bit kids literally rule the world they for, do for, Timmy for a hot becomes second there the president and also there's no war when kids rule the world I mean, Apparently. like, yeah, that's fair. Like, maybe there's snowball fights or, you know, other kinds of violence, but there's no war. Are you kidding cause me? Because kids just aren't organized. They're not organized, but they're impulsive as fuck. <laughs> like, Yeah, but, I mean, that's the point. It's like, they're impulsive as fuck, but that, that cuts both ways. You can't raise an army of kids unless you're an adult. And then I there's suppose. a real-world sadness to that. All right. I'm sorry to bring adult stuff into this. We're, we're supposed to just be talking about kids just, just talking being about kids. kids. Um, there's, like, a musical number. Like, like this really is schools out the musical because there's a musical number every five to ten minutes in this show that goes on for about three minutes each at minimum. And they're, and they're it's awful, only, awful songs. Oh, they're the most catchy songs you'll ever hear your, in your entire life. Like, I have not, like, I must hate myself or something because I just kind of love them. <laughs> like, for how trash they are. They're so enjoyable. There, there's something truly funny about somebody starting a song, like, in a really dramatic, sincere tone of voice and going, Hey, Flappy Bob, can't you see what they've done? Dun, dun, like, dun. that's just too much for me. It's great. Man. It's wonderful. It's it's All right, so that's beautiful. your prime example. That's I think it is because literally there are at least two moments in this where people like where kids literally write the words "kids rule" with a Z like right. on adult property, and it's just about like right. screw you, adults, you can't tell us what to do, blah blah blah. Right, but that's why I think this is too like post ironic. Like this is a postmodern interpretation of the kids rule trope. The the real kids rule like media is Big Fat Liar. That is like yeah quintessential. Yeah, I, well, is it quintessential just because like like I feel like Big Fat Liar is a quintessential movie from like my childhood, but I just don't know if it's like the quintessential like kids rule trope. I think it is because okay. kids rule to me when you get like down to the basics, it's that adults are shitty like they're just out to screw you okay. and your whole life revolves around just these bad adults that are trying to ruin your life 
um, your and fun. you are just this like genius kid. You know, <laughs> you're like an adult. You know, you can write a, a win, uh, an, an award winning screenplay at the age of 14. 14. Like you can do that because you're just transgressive like that. And it's the 90s. So you're on your cell phone and like you call your friend on your cell phone and you tell them to like do the voice and then they <laughs> fake the voice over the cell phone and the teacher is none the wiser Ugh. until you get busted and have to go to summer school. Blah, blah, blah. And then and you I just mean, want like, your dad to trust you. Right. Like there is like heart to it. There's always going to be is. some heart to it, but like that never makes it into the trailers, oh, which is no. important. The trailers like there's are no just, heart like, in any of these trailers. <laughs> one thing I think that's like I think pretty true for almost all these examples is that there's like a high frequency of pranks or like tricks. No, that it's because because you can't murder the the adults. You can't. <laughs> so what do you do? You you prank them, and that's how you get your comeuppance. I'm sorry. I'm just so processing well you can't murder the adults well so like so like the the whole thing is that these movies are revolutionary in tone the the cartoons are revolutionary it's about a kid revolution fighting against the powers that be tyranny and oppression the tyranny of of adulthood yeah exactly and i i think like that kind of plays against them honestly they play it a little too dramatically and so it forces them to just rely on these cliches of how you stop them. So, I mean, there's a few examples where they actually do beat up the adults. So that's Codename Kids Next Door, basically, and that's it. Right. Um, um, but I then for everyone like, else, it's it's a lot of pranks. Uh, Hook and Peter Pan, they do some some fighting. Yeah, but those are pirates. Like, they're not yeah. real people. <laughs> And I guess it is sort of like prankish beating them up. You know, it's like pushing them off yeah. of like. There's zany hijinks. Right. It's the same level of like Home Alone, like adult injury. Exactly. Um, I guess in Harry Potter, there's spells. Yeah, they do actually fight adults, but they're Nazis. So like, whatever. Exactly. So, I mean, I think most of these are pretty apolitical. Big Fat Liar may be the most apolitical. Like, the joke is just that Hollywood and adult Hollywood is, you know, corrupt and, like, full of these lying producers who just scheme to get their way. And they all look like Paul Giamatti to some extent. Right. Um, so it is very satisfying where he gets turned blue and gets red dye in his hair and then he gets sent to a a, a part like a child's birthday party where a bunch of violent kids attack him because they Beat think he's up. a birthday clown. Right. And you get just the shot of him getting kicked in the balls while it's a wide angle shot. So his face is all distorted <laughs> and he's like he's he's really mugging for the camera. He's going, whoa. Is, and it's Paul Giamatti's face just stretched out. That's at the end also. It's twice it's in the twice. same movie. Yeah, yeah. And I think yeah. that's the 90s. And I think that's why our, our our entire culture is poisoned. Millennial culture. But like, this is why do we don't buy napkins. Because we're not boring like Paul Giamatti. I don't think that's poison. I think, like, you know, fuck adults. <laughs> You know, like, we, is it? Why does it have to be poison? Because there's no substance to it. It's it's apolitical emptiness. It's it doesn't fulfill any meaning in your life once you actually reach adulthood. Because what are you left with? <laughs> Candy and making a mess, peeing in the shower. What are you left oh with? My God. <laughs> I mean, you're left. Well, hopefully, you'll have some politics. I think it's just anti-authoritarian, you know. But I Wait, guess but that's, that's what I'm own. saying: is anti-authoritarian politics when it's completely divorced from any actual injustice going on uh-huh. is it, it? It's a it's like a clear way to just like ruin you psychologically, just yeah, just yeah. total decimation of your soul. <laughs> okay. And I'm a victim of this too. What do I believe in? Nothing. <laughs> Okay, well... This has ruined me. I'm sorry that Big Fat Liar and Holes and... It turned me into this monster. Ned's I'm a, I'm a grown-up. ...have ruined you. <laughs> Listen. It is interesting watching a lot of these movies as an adult, because a lot of time, Like, there were a couple of moments where, like, Paul Giamatti kept calling 
um, <laughs> Frankie Muniz's characters, like, different ages. And I was like, yeah, I would do that with a child. I'd be like, what are you, yeah. seven? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, like, it's difficult to tell. Frankie Muniz has looked the same age for about 30 years uh, now. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, um, and I just think the reason, like, Big Fat Liar, part of it is just the casting. Like, Amanda Bynes and Frankie Muniz. It's like, great. Two people who don't exist anymore. <laughs> <laughs> they've just, they vanished off they've the face vanished. of the earth. But they, yeah. like, but here they're, like, giving, you know, career-defining performances. Oh, yeah. As, you know, like, this is what we know them from. I mean, obviously we know Frankie Muniz from Malcolm in the Middle. And obviously we know Amanda Bynes from The Amanda Show and all that. But but this is where they, they really, they hit the big screen. For the first That's time. All. Yeah. I don't know if it was the first time for both of them, but... Well, I mean, one of the first times, you know, like, yeah. For sure. And they, you know, they're they're schemers, you know? That's that's a big part of it, is being able to scheme the adults. The kids, they're, they outwit the adults, even Mm -hmm. though they're the, they're like the ultimate underdog. You want to talk about underdogs? Sure, I guess. Um, I I mean, like, I was going to say, like... A lot of these movies definitely feel like power fantasies, you know, yes. but instead of like superheroes, it's like, oh no, your neighbor down the street with some two by four technology is able to uh, fight back against things like bedtimes right. or broccoli right. or whatever. But the whole thing is is typically that like, it's like a strength in numbers thing. Like kids are mm-hmm. united. Kids, mm-hmm. we're not like bogged down by petty things like race like everyone in these movies is a <laughs> rainbow coalition well um, like we're not yes bothered no. by these like these these petty divisions that adults face so we can unify and just face the oppressors the true oppressors adults yeah but what then was... once you become an adult that you know that that ideology falls apart and that's that's how you get depression <laughs> lack of Lack of lack of motivation, lack of you know. Kid revolution. There's no. Because what, what are we supposed to do? Just give it to the Zoomers? I mean, they're like they're more fucked up than we were. What are the Zoomers? Gen- Generation Z. Oh, oh, are they Zoomers now? Oh boy. They're post us. Just not heard that term. Yeah. Um. Did you did you have anything on this list that like rewatching you felt like differently about or like watching for the first time you're kind of like what even is this i feel like it was about what i expected i was surprised to find a couple of examples that were much more recent um there was this film middle school the worst years of my life that came out like a year and a half ago um yeah on netflix no it wasn't a netflix movie it was in theaters oh what it just wasn't there for very long, and it wasn't very popular, and now it's on Netflix if you want to check it out. It's interesting. It's like – it's it's way more political. This is the thing that I find really interesting is all of these movies that we grew up on were 100% like apolitical. They were about things well, like fun I- and <laughs> – kidness and being extreme and safety, but they weren't like – Okay, what should our school board vote on? Should they support the arts or should right. they support test scores? You know, mm. like these are very different things. And like middle school, the rules are all designed to keep this like conservative principle in power. And yeah, the principle actually... is bad. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. Yeah, I was just going to totally agree with you because um, also like a recent example is um, the Captain Underpants movie. And, like, that right. also is about, like, text, like, test scores and not, uh, like, allowing creativity in the schools and, like, being slave to scantrons and stuff like that. That's really, yeah. I, that's a definitely an interesting shift, I think, in these movies. Um, There's always, like, a there's always a, an undercurrent of test scores and, and whatnot, Um. But it's it's usually just framed much more simplistically in the like in kids the ones hate that we tests, grew up on. so tests are bad. Not like right. teaching to the test is bad, and there's stifling no room creativity for art. And, right. and whatever. Yeah. So like um, in recess, uh, schools out. 
the the film I guess that uh, one's also about test scores. Yeah, so the the villain is trying to destroy summer vacation mm-hmm. by moving the moon and <laughs> making the world colder. <laughs> <laughs> and it keeps like the joke is that they just keep talking about like the test scores in Norway because it's cold. <laughs> <laughs> and like that's really funny and it's the it's, best. It's the super best funny, thing. especially because the reality of that is the fact that like they all have recess like for an hour every day and like get off, <laughs> like don't have homework and like all of this like weird liberal shit that. Right, like, but. Yeah. Yeah, it's James Woods plays the villain and he's such a good villain. Amazing job. He's a monster in real life. <laughs> um <laughs> and he's just he's just going at, I hate recess. I hate summer vacation and I will destroy it for the test scores. Yeah. For my career. <laughs> Yeah, for his career. So, like, it's a little bit more simplistic though than uh than like middle school, which still has the evil you know, principal in this case, mm-hmm. who literally takes people's books of art and like dunks them in acid because, it's well, like... I mean, do you got a better way to get rid of notebooks? <laughs> uh, it's like absolutely insane. It felt like, um, freaking what's who framed Roger Rabbit, you know, like, yeah, no, it was the literally tunes. the scene from Who Framed Roger Rabbit, yeah. with, complete with cartoons, like, bursting out of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, like, the main character in middle school, the worst years of my life, is uh, this guy named uh, Rafe, uh, and he's, like, an artist. <laughs> so um, he's got a notebook full of art. His mom's a sous chef, um, and he's, like, depressed, you know, because she's, his uh, brother died of cancer. She's the- worst mom maybe like maybe worse than home alone but it, it doesn't kind of cops to that but just the fact that like at least she's supportive you know like like it cops to the fact that like he's he's a troubled kid because of his home life um and he he, he you know he does these pranks largely out of like his family's instability and his own emotional issues but right. um, it still it, it still out, frames those like pranks that he pulls as being really effective in upsetting the power balance. Right. But in this case, it's super specifically about how like s- kids are getting left behind in these remedial classes and right. schools don't focus on them because they don't earn the money. And, right. you know, this guy's profiting off of excluding people from taking the standardized test. Like it's so political mm-hmm. and that's why it's different. Yeah. Even though it's largely the same plot as Max Keeble's big move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's fair. Um, th- can we talk about the name of his fucking prank project for a second? No, we can't. It's too dumb. It's really dumb, and I just need the world to know that his name is Rafe, which is a stupid name anyway. R-A-F-E. And uh, he names his little rule-breaking project Rules aren't for everyone, which is just an acronym of his stupid first name. Also, he hallucinates his dead brother um, throughout this entire movie, and it's, like, supposed to... It's a twist, I guess, that he's I mean, dead. it is a twist. I, I mean, it's, it's not a great twist. I mean, it's not a great movie. No. But I just think, like... I, compared to a lot of these, it has, like, a lot more depth, like, surprisingly. And there's also these, like, crazy animated segments that are really fun and interesting. The animated um, segments were very entertaining. And I just think, like, child acting has gotten, like, substantially better. Like, uh, in the last yes, ten years. Maybe. I feel like it has. Um, <laughs> you know, feel free to argue with me in, on Twitter, guys. But, like, I just think... <laughs> You know, our I, our I modern think, child actors have, have really, like, upped the game. I don't know. I think you could cherry pick examples. And, like, I, this felt very scripted by the book. Like, it, like they're, it was child actors. I wasn't, like, blown out of the water or anything. It wasn't, like, Max Keeble's big move, though. <laughs> <laughs> this movie's great. I mean, it's stupid uh and it's a it's a disney movie it's surprisingly not a decom yeah it was weird though because it stars the dad 
uh, is the dad from Lizzie McGuire, and the main character is, like, the little brother from Lizzie McGuire, and I just remember being like, it's weird that you guys are also playing father and son in a different thing. Right. It's also weird that Josh Peck is here playing Josh a guy Peck named Rogue. is in every single one of these fucking movies. Holy shit. He's in shit. two. Let's not get carried away. If I that's too too many. Like He's in Snow Day and <laughs> and Max Keeble's big move. Both of them as like this like nerdy like best friend type. Yeah. But it's just like clearly he had like a niche for a while. Oh yeah, big time. Till he got the Amanda show, and that's where his career really took off. Oh yeah. Um, and then died. <laughs> <laughs> but Max Keeble, Max Keeble is unique, uh, partially in just like just how evil the principal is. Although they all get like different amounts of just cruel and unusual principles. Um, it's always <laughs> interesting to me that it's like the principal who's the worst and like not usually like a specific teacher or something like the teachers are all boring and like dumb or like because teachers don't have as much authority you want to get to the man at the top and like you know kids don't really have a conception of what a superintendent is or like a school board so like the most experience they get with authority is from a principal yeah, okay. I, I guess especially, like, in elementary school, you're, like, much more familiar with who your school principal is than, like, later on. Right. Um, I mean, like, in Holes, it's the warden. <laughs> yes, yes. In Hoot, it's, a, it's an evil oil driller. It's not right. always a principal. It's just, like, it's always an adult. It's, it's always, always a grown-up. Well, yeah, right. They're but, always but... wearing a suit. In most things that are set in a school, it tends to be, like, the principal. Right. Um, in Ned's Declassified, it's the vice principal. That, because he's I, Miami Vice principal. And it's amazing. I <laughs> I did not know that fact until you told me about it last week. Um, it's, and, he's, yeah, you know, it's vice, vice principal Crubs, and he always says Crubs out. And he's dressed up like he's from Miami Vice, and so he's a Miami Vice principal, and it's hilarious. It's interesting in a lot of these like live action ones that it's often like the janitor who's like on the side of the kids, which I always think is very interesting. Y- yeah, it's like a class thing. There's something yeah. to that. Like in Sweet um, Life, you know, like Mr. Mosby, the hotel manager, is like the evil authority figure, sort of. And then yeah. like, you know, the bellhop and the janitor are their friends. What was his what? name? No, Gordy was from uh, Ned's Declassified. Yeah. What was the name? Arwin? Was it Ar- Arwin? the or something the like super? that. He was like the yeah. superintendent. He's, yeah, I I don't know. He had a crush on their mom. It was strange. Yeah, um, it was gross. Yeah. Um, he, he was a dirty, dirty man who lived in the basement. <laughs> There's a lot of single moms or <laughs> moms. Yeah, there is a lot of single of moms. What is that? Yeah, I don't know. It's What's up with that? There, very few of them are about dads. I think Big Fat Liar is a little bit unique in that. In that Big Fat Liar is like, about dad. Yeah. Um, well, I guess Hook is also kind of about dads, but in like a weird way. Yeah. Um, I feel like a lot of them can be about like father figures. I mean, mm-hmm. like in Recess, School's Out, um, it's a lot about growing up. And um, so Tej, TJ, he uh, befriends his mortal enemy, the principal, in order to take down the Save bigger threat recess. of James Woods. <laughs> yeah. I just love that, like, at the end, like, I love Recess Schools Out. Like, it's, it's so good. Everything about it just hits all the right notes for me. Like, you know, everyone's going to summer camp. Like, like, that to me feels the most, like, what summer as a kid was like and what you, like, sort of imagined it could be if, like, you discovered an evil plot to end summer (laughs) living in your school, you know? Um, like it, it really was, you know, cause, cause recess had that ethos to begin with where, sure. you know, there's, there's hustler kid and there's the diggers and like, like everyone's got their own thing, their own gimmick. And you just sort of like use it to do whatever hijinks you need to. Um, and then, you know, of course, of course everyone's going to have like some, 
like strategic value in storming an elementary school and beating up adult <laughs> mooks. Yeah, and they found ninjas. a way to use they found a way to use Mikey's singing as oh, a yeah. weapon. I love so, it. So great. It's great. It's good. The the little savage kindergartners. I really thought that because they set up that his singing can break glass and then they at the end when there's a big climax, there's a big glass laser. So I, I really thought he was going to sing to do it. But then it was like, really? Throw the baseball. Yeah, it's the baseball. Co- thing I was like, OK, so you just had a on. baseball anyway. So like, what was even the problem? <laughs> you got to you got to ignore what those adults at camp told you. Aim, Vince. You're a kid. You know how to throw a baseball. You know, like that's that's what that know. is. Yeah, I love this movie. Everyone go watch <sighs> Recess School's Out right now. I I don't know what it is. There was some kind of like filter on my brain as a kid where I thought that movie was better animated than it was. <laughs> it's it's like, like really cheap animation. Yeah, there's some really cheap scenes. There's some like good ones. In my memory, this is like this was like Disney feature film level animation. <laughs> like, but then I went to watch it and I was like, oh, they're just basically like digitally colored in cutouts on a CG background that's really obvious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the opening shot and the ending shot are like that. And then, you know, there's some scenes in the middle that sort of do that. But I, I think for the most part, it, it holds up decently. You know, you know who doesn't like adults? You know who hates adults? Who hates adults, David? Damn it, I wish I remembered his name. What the fuck is his goddamn <laughs> name? Really undercut yourself there. I know, I really did. Who wrote Willy Wonka? Oh, Roald Dahl. Roald Dahl. No, that's the thing. Roald Dahl fucking hated children, too. But he hates adults so much more than he hates children. I, he just like, hated everyone. He was not a pleasant person. <laughs> no, he was, by all accounts, like a miserable, lonesome, horrible man yeah. no one liked. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> but he did a really great job for a long time of writing stories about kids like kicking butt against adults, adults. who yep. who were you know just too up in their own grills to to, to understand like the moral purity of children right or or just like they were too stupid or too like corrupt or too like anything yeah. else um so we're talking like james and the giant right. peach you know yep. J- in the beginning james is at a, a bad orphanage of where adults torture the kids <laughs> and he, you know, he gets out of that one. And then, you know, I guess Willy Wonka doesn't really have it. But the witches for sure has it where, oh, yeah. like, all adult women are literally transformed <laughs> into horrible monsters. Uh, yeah. Who eat children. Yummy. Yeah. And I mean, Matilda, too. Matilda's just, the big like, one. Matilda is the most adult-hating film of all time except for the one good teacher except for the one good pure morally righteous teacher which there's right. always one there's always gonna yeah. be one good one because because every kid has like at least one adult they kind of like you know who's right. maybe kind of nice to them right but they get painted as sort of like a saintly figure right um, whereas the rest of them are just authorities the mm-hmm. trunchbull is like such a figure of like easy Myth. to hate like nonsense like she's she has a closet full of spikes called the chokey where she puts children who misbehave like it's just like some next level shit you know it's really next level she throws kids by their pigtails Pigtails, yep she forces them to like to eat an entire chocolate cake and like gorge themselves in front of the school and like it's just fucked up shit right and she's not the only bad parent i mean there's also danny devito oh yeah yeah and the wife like you know they're corrupt evil scheming people who are lazy and don't eat healthy and don't like reading and you know right there's a lot of moral judgments about things that aren't necessarily bad right like the 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 thing that i always come back to is that like danny devito is like yelling at his daughter quit reading you gotta watch tv Mm -hmm. like there's no parent that's like (laughs) i mean who knows the world is wide (laughs) 
The world is wide. There's, I'm sure there's plenty of parents who are potentially insecure uh, about their intelligence relative to their child's. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's the case. But, I mean, this was just willful, like, why can't you be stupid like us? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's it's really interesting. Um, it, like, it was something that I, I noticed as we were making this list and as I was, like, watching things. Um, there's not a lot of like girls or like female led uh properties in the same way that there are like the there might be like a main female character but like the quote unquote protagonist like main character of who has the biggest arc and we spend the most time with is usually a dude in these things even in ensembles um which i think is interesting oh it's for sure interesting i think it shows that like there's kind of a perception that like speaking truth to power is like a masculine thing even when you're a child there's some kind of like weird bias that they have where why can't the the ladies lead the revolution why does it have to be the boys well i think one part of it comes from the fact where you know it's it's that like sexist thing where it's like oh girls mature faster than boys and Uh. so like you know like they're they're all teachers pets and like they all like uh you know School. They all like school and they all like the teachers and like they just need yeah. someone like brave to show them why they're being like brainwashed. Or there what is have some you. factual basis to the idea that sure. like, ki- like boys commit more pranks than women. Like, girls? Like, I mean, children? is there? Or is that just, like, a thing we have because we grew up in the 90s watching boys commit pranks no, movies there, all the time? No, I'm sure you could find statistics about, like, child delinquency. Sure, and but... I think you'd find that, like, things like graffiti and stuff, like, there's... Mm-hmm. Th- they typically tend to fall into these, like... Peer pressure right. from boys is different than peer pressure from girls. Right, right? but it, it's... For sure, for sure. Um, but I, But I think, you know, it's, like... I'm not saying that developmentally it's sexist to notice that there are different stages of like childhood development potentially that are potentially right, but gendered. It, reinforcing but, it right. is, is a yeah. different matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not I'm not like making excuses <laughs> for these shows. I'm just saying like there's a lot of stuff that goes into picking who's gonna be your protagonist. Right. And for the most part in the nineties it was Who's the most marketable white boy that we can find? Well, well, I mean, also, I, like, I think this is still an ethos in a lot of children's television, though I, I see it slowly starting to shift to, like, a slightly more egalitarian, um, like, balance, where, mm-hmm. you know, if, if it's got a boy in it, girls will still watch it, but if it's got a girl in it, boys won't watch it, you know, like, like that sort of thing. Um, and, and I think like, again, it's changing. Like, I think there are more shows that, that challenge that certainly than there used to be. Um, but, but I still sort of see it as like, you know, you always have to have the boy and the girl. There's very few shows where it's like a predominantly female cast and like, maybe there's one or two dudes. Like, you know, the only one I can really yeah. think of is like she and like maybe Steven Universe, but like even Steven Universe, the main character's a dude. Um, yeah, no, so I, I mean, know. male protagonist ship is, you know, it, it's a pervasive problem even outside sure. of this yeah. group. And, oh. like, honestly, I don't really necessarily see a problem with shows that have, like, a really egalitarian balance. No, like, I, don't, I don't have a problem with As long as it's not fake, which, because, yeah. like, a lot of them have, like, a fake balance where it's really just that the girl is, like, a love interest or, right. like, an annoying little sister mm-hmm. or, you know, something something clearly ancillary to the plot. But, I mean, something like Gravity Falls, I think, does a pretty good job of balancing. Oh, yeah, and, like, Star versus you know. the Forces of Evil. Um, yeah, there's which... the boy protagonist and the girl protagonist. Right. And, like, neither one is really, like, like above the other one in right. terms of how many stories they get. Mm-hmm. Like the story is about their relationship and their friendship and right. their siblingship and mm-hmm. how you get from point A to point B. Yeah. But you know, for these ones, that's not what it's about. It's no. It's about <laughs> it's about throwing off revolution. the shackles of adulthood. Like, um, yeah. wishing that all the adults would just disappear so that you could do whatever you want. 
Yeah, I think Fairly Odd Parents to return to that for a second. Like yeah. outside of the schools out the musical. Oh, in general, the, it's very much the that. anti-adult sentiments of it are like very deeply felt in the very premise, which is that as soon as Timmy ages out of like being a kid, he loses his fairy godparents that give him godlike powers. Mm-hmm. So, like the entire stakes is that he doesn't want to grow up. And this right. is like this is like f- from season one. There's an episode where he wishes to be an adult and then he like loses his fairies. And so like Or doesn't he wish to be like, like a teenager or something? No, he wishes to be an adult, adult. and he becomes a balding, like oh, okay. hairy fat man. Okay. God, I love the T V hopping episode. <laughs> now I'm just Yeah, the like... T V hopping episode he does because he he does meet himself as a hot studly man. It's... Which is played by Alec Baldwin. <laughs> yeah, but that one also is about time. like not growing up, like, right? You know, yeah, you know, I want to be on TV forever because on TV nobody has to grow up. Totally, and I mean, Codename Kids Next Door also has the same sort of like ticking time bomb to adulthood, where it's like you get decommissioned when you turn thirteen and become yeah. a teenager. Um, it's literally just this this like fear of adulthood that just pervades or like nineties and and but really more like mid two thousands television because yeah. that was when we sort of started questioning the tropes of the nineties yeah like I think that even applies to like the Jimmy Neutron movie oh Which, do you for want to talk sure. about Jimmy Neutron yeah um Sheen is peeing in the shower <laughs> yeah that's it that's all that's it like what else do you it's, need? it really like speaks to like this the movie literally the premise is just like what if all adults got abducted by aliens and that made them it, do the it's basically dance. a two minute montage before they like realize that it's shit and that it, the world is not great without yeah. parents yeah which is honestly an interesting lesson for a lot of these movies because like i don't feel like a lot of them end where it's like Oh, darn, we should have kept those parents around, you know? No, like, like Max Keeble, like, the the principal gets his comeuppance. Mm-hmm. Matilda, um, Matilda, I think, actually divorces her parents and, like, goes yep. to live on her own. Well, she lives um, with Miss Honey, the one good adult. Yeah, in holes, like, the warden and, uh, you know, John Voight really get screwed over and go to prison yeah um you know it's always the big bad adults they get they get punished they get punished and like it's it's true in um you know ferris bueller and like uh so many of these so many of these like fairly odd parents the adults are always punished in recess the the bad evil guy trying to stop summer like gets his justice in (laughs) <laughs> in Codename Kids Next Door, like, the kids always win. And Big Fat Liar, Paul Giamatti becomes a birthday clown for realsies. Like, <laughs> Yeah, and then know? in Bigger, Fatter Liar, they did the exact oh, same no. movie again, but with Barry Boswick instead of Paul Giamatti. And Barry Boswick, you know, love him, love him or hate him, or not know who he is. I have no but... idea who he is. <laughs> but basically, he's no Paul Giamatti. Uh, <laughs> and basically... Changing the plot so that instead of being a movie, it's a video game doesn't like make it a better movie. Uh, no, I couldn't imagine it would. It doesn't really update it at all. And also, changing him from being turned blue to being turned white so that he's a mime, that also does not make it more funny. No, mimes aren't like the funny part wasn't that he was a clown, it's just that he's blue and people mistook it like it was also fun that he was a clown but like it was he looked like a clown you know and he got beat up by the kids at the birthday party right like that was funny what isn't funny is you get turned into a mime and then you go to like a bar where they hate mimes and they throw you out of the bar that's so stupid no one is gonna also there's like a weird scene where he like you know, he puts makeup over his, like, white face face dye, and then it, like, sweats off of him like the Joker oh. in, um, you remember, the, you remember the Joker in the original Batman movie? He, like, puts makeup over his facial deformity and it sweats <laughs> off, except they yeah. don't have the budget to do that effect, so it just, like, literally just, like, painted on sweat drops. Oh my god. It's awful. <laughs> Bad movie. Don't watch Bigger, Fatter, Liar. We do we do these things for you. 
Yeah, we've we've really fallen on our swords. Um, I think the one that I hated watching the most was probably this weird movie called Snow Day, starring <laughs> Chevy Chase. I guess question mark. Yeah, no, of course Chevy Chase. Like he was still that was still a time where he was like down on his luck. He didn't really have any roles for him, but people still recognized him from you know Christmas Vacation and stuff. So they were uh-huh. like, put him in the holiday movie for kids. Uh, it's so, but it's like not even a holiday movie. It's it, just it was like, a, it was released around Christmas. Okay, it had to be right. I guess who even knows? It's just about kids who wish for a snow day because the tagline is anything can happen on a snow day, which is a it was like dumb, the crash of kids movies. It's so stupid, and it's just about a horny teenager like falling in love with a stupid girl but that wasn't what the marketing was about the marketing no. was the marketing was snowplow man snow snowplow day. man is the villain and he's gonna take out snow days forever and make you go to school that's the weird thing about snow day the movie i feel like there's too many things going on in it like yeah it's I think crash it, it's it's crash we it, know it's, it's, just, it's just a lot of subplots and no main plot right. it's you know valentine's day it's new year's day it's you know yeah. it's all these things yeah like like everyone has their own little story that like they managed to resolve fine i guess like the business mom learns that she should stay at home with her three-year-old, I guess. And uh, <laughs> Chevy Chase becomes a successful weatherman against that annoying Chet. Is is it Chet or Chad? I literally could not figure it it's out. It's both. Like <laughs> Chet's and Chad's. I mean, like he's he's a Chad in the incel, like Reddit <laughs> sense of a Chad. Right. And he's also a Chet in the um, I'm Chet, you betcha. 90s sense of a chet right everybody knows what a chet and a chad is and they're the same person (laughs) basically (laughs) um chet always hosting the news uh yeah right so like there's that and then there's like the horny teenage son trying to figure out which girl he likes and it's very dumb uh it's the best friend it's but the girl then, next door. But then the real movie should have just been about these stupid fucking kids trying to take on Snowplow Man. Like that was the most interesting part of the whole thing. Well, I mean, it certainly was, but I mean, you can't it's like hard to do a whole movie just about kids throwing snowballs at a guy in a snowplow. I don't know how you would do that. But I, I feel I mean, like these movie like Codename Kids Next Door is nothing but that, you know? Right, but that's because like, it's a cartoon and it can and also each episode is only fifteen minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay. But like they have Ten their minutes, whole really. they have, they have a couple of movies in there. Like you Yeah, know, but the movies have... are about really big stuff, like this you know, apocalyptic villain named Grandfather who wants to turn everyone into senior city zombies. Mm. And so he takes, you know, he, he takes over the world. And and then it turns out that actually um, the number one's father was actually the used legendary. to be number zero until he turned into an adult. And mm-hmm. it's like, like big, big stories. It's not just, we got to stop Snowplow Man. <laughs> All right. But, but I, there I is something to the snowplow man and the kids next door thing. Of yeah. These adults, they're not just adults. Mm-hmm. They take a sick pleasure in making children miserable. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And this is part of what ruined our generation is we assume that everything that is in the world is not just like an accident of, uh, you know, an accident of the systems that be. It is, it is the people in power taking sick pleasure in abusing us. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, so I mean, it's sure. let's not blame the system. It's let's blame these individuals who are cruel. I I don't know if that's true about the millennial generation. I think we're very <laughs> quick to say this is systemic and that annoys other people. I don't know. I think we're very quick to demonize and individualize people as well. You know, that's, I mean, that's sure. cancel culture. That's, yeah, you know, absolutely. and I, I'm not saying cancel culture is an inherently negative thing. So don't, you know, don't quote me on that. But like, I think, I think we are toxic. very quick to assign like this person is 
is a bad person Mm -hmm. and bad not just because of the systems that like went to create that person but bad because they take a sick pleasure in oppressing others okay I, I just like mean, snow plow man who plows snow like, not to, because he's a working class <laughs> gentleman with a job, but because he hates children and hates that they play in the snow right. and wants to see them roll under his snow plow. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's pretty fair characterization of I think most of these villains, you know. Yeah, the principals that they all just they hate kids. And it's like, they why did you get into them. principling? What is wrong with you? Well, I mean, that's why I love the the recess movie because yes. like it it sort of like interrogates that a little bit, you know? Like the yeah. principal's like, I don't hate kids. I'm just trying to do my job and like you make it hard, but honestly, like I love that you make it hard. Like I'd rather have that any day than like no school at all cuz like kids deserve like, you know, he's sort of on the side of kids and like the whole adventure right. makes him realize that, you know, I got into this business to to help kids, not punish them. And I'm going to take that with me into the new school year, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, 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 there's like messages like that every now and again for, for an adult in one of these where they sort of rediscover the joy of childhood and what it means to be a, be a kid. Exactly. I think we've we've sort of like covered the the really like good examples of these. Yeah. Um do you want to start like breaking apart these like weird outliers that like don't quite fit? Um like like w- let's let's talk about series of unfortunate events. I've been dying to talk about series of unfortunate events. Yeah. Let's 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 bring it home with the weirdos. Um <laughs> What are what are your thoughts on series of unfortunate events, David? Like, adults are dumber in this show than they may be in any other show. Like, they're less evil for the most part, but they're way dumber. Well, like, the kids are just infinitely smarter than the adults. For sure. I, I think Series of Unfortunate Events is an interesting one because I I feel like this one is also kind of political. Um I, I mean, like, not as overtly as, like, test scores. And, like, so, they're like, cutting I think we talked funding. about Series of Unfortunate Events, like, a little bit before. And it's, like, what Series of Unfortunate Events is, like, at its core is it's kind of, like, a pure elitism where, yeah. like, the thing that makes you good is that you read books mm-hmm. and that you're learned. Mm-hmm. And if you're not, then you're a bad person. Like, if right. you don't know a spell, you're a bad person. Right. It's It's the idea that... There are wicked people and they are stupid or like they're able to be yeah. or incompetent and like they're able to be wicked because everyone else is also stupid or incompetent. Um, right. And even if they're they have good intentions, they're just too dumb to like do anything about it because there's all these right. I mean, rules. It is anti-authoritarian, you know, clearly like the kids just want to be left alone. They don't want to be enslaved but they do want (laughs) protection right um but they learn that they can't get that you know like that's the moral of the whole series is that like you're you can't look to adults for protection and to guide you for yourself um but but like you know series of unfortunate events is also like weird in that the moral is it also sort of breaks down that elitism um, and like the moral purity of what it means. must have missed that part. Oh, re- well, I mean, I guess the elite, like the elitism is still there, but like the, you know, it, it, it's, oh yeah, it challenges corrupts. the idea that there are purely wicked people because right, Olaf right. is not quite so wicked by the end. But the, the point being like, it doesn't matter if they're wicked or not. Cause they're stupid. Sure. I guess. But, but I think it's, it's not so much that like, Oh, woobifying villains. It's about the fact that like these kids have to do some pretty terrible things to survive, you know? Sure. Um, and that, like, they they don't get to remain innocent, fun, loving children as, like, all the other kids in these, like, Right. So I guess that do. does makes it sort of not fit as a kid's rule narrative because things don't really rule for these kids. <laughs> right. Even I think though they are, like, way smarter and they do want to disrupt the powers that be and it mm-hmm. is revolutionary in tone. 
they're not having a good time. They're really not. <laughs> they're not, not it's, having food fights. <laughs> no, it's it's less kids rule and more just like adults drool. You know, it's just adults drool without the kids rule. Right, and in a way that makes it so unique and interesting, and in a oh, way yeah. it just makes it a little less fun. Maybe it's a little like, less fun, but but I think you know, like the the writing and sort of general absurdity yeah. of the series are there. I mean, it's to, just so well written. Make up though. for that, yeah. It's it's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and then we we also kind of have to talk about like there are some shows where there are there are no adults there, and yet it still is kind of kids' rule. It, mm-hmm. Like even though there's no like adults to show for contrast, it still feels very kids' rule. And I think Ed Ed and Eddie is prime prime real estate there no parents they they just don't appear in that show <laughs> right which is always so interesting because like these kids literally just run around and do whatever the fuck they want you know right i mean it's a call back to a simpler time where people left their doors unlocked um and, <laughs> and let the their kids go sack. buy jawbreakers down by the candy shop for a quarter yeah i mean like clearly like even though these kids look like they're from the 90s like it seems like it's calling back to, like, the 70s or something. Right. Like, I don't it's, even know. It, it, it felt weirdly dated as a kid. Like, just, like, the, Yet the situation. also shockingly modern. Like, yes. Because there was no show like it in just nope. its irreverence. And, like, just every punchline was just somebody saying something random. <laughs> and, like, yeah. hitting them and making, like, a weird sound effect. Like, like, every time you hit somebody with, like, a wooden board, it would make a horse whinny sound. And then they would say, oh, buttered toast or something. Like, this was the show that you watched to make your parents angry. I guess. I didn't love it any. No, I I was not a huge fan. I mean, I I liked it. I watched it. I mean, it was of my generation more than it was of yours, I suppose. Well, no, no, no. It was, I I think it was solidly of my generation. I, this show (laughs) to me felt like one of those things where there was like, there felt like there was a gender divide for this one. Oh, yeah, that's fair. It is very masculine. But, I mean, I, I don't know. I knew, I knew a lot of girls who watched it. But <laughs> the point being, like, it's, it's a show about there's no parents. Mm-hmm. And the kids are just running the show. But totally. they just recreate all of these adult situations. Oh, like, yeah. Like, they're scamming each other. Mm-hmm. They they're, just want uh, a quarter to buy a jawbreaker. Yeah, they're playing pranks on each other. They're still pranks. And it's just a show that parents just don't understand. Yeah. Oh, wait, we got to talk about parents just don't understand. The Will Smith of it all. Oh, God. Will Smith wrote a song in the 90s called Parents Just Don't Understand. This is what we grew up on. This is what our <laughs> lives are. This is what and it is. And now many of us are parents. And we know that we don't understand. And that's yeah. a curse. This is a curse on our generation. <laughs> it's the curse that we must bear. Yeah, we have the knowledge that even as we bear children, we will never understand those children. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, isn't that sort of... No, yeah, I guess, I guess you're right. No, our parents like, Daria... believed that they could dissect the code of childhood, and that's how you get Flappy Bob's Lernatorium uh-huh. and other such child prisons. Mm-hmm. But we, but the thing is, parents just don't understand because kids rule. Kids rule! But, like, it's interesting because I feel like parenting trends aren't moving in a kids rule direction. They're moving in, like, a helicopter parent direction and, like, right. bulldozer because, parent. because parents... Parents now know that they don't understand their kids, but they're horrified by that realization. Oh, okay. So they just they now uh, they, na- they now know that kids like much like them want to destroy them. And so they <laughs> must surveil them. They must watch their every move on the social media. Okay. Because kids are plotting our demise. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of kids plotting demise, um one one thing that I did want to bring up before we wrap this up is um, Harry Potter and specifically Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. Um, yeah, that's the only one where it really feels like deeply anti-authoritarian because you've always got like friendly Mr. Dumbledore to be like, you know, hey, you're a bad professor, Snape. Stop punishing these children. Uh, right. Give them awards. Except in 
Except in Order of the Phoenix. Except in Order of the Phoenix, because he pieces out. Um, and, like, you know, there's, like, troublemaking and rule-breaking and hijinks. But, like, that's sort of the conceit of, like, a boarding school narrative to begin with. Um, yes. You know, is, is that, like, ah, it's, it's, it's summer camp, basically, but in a school, you know? Yes. Um, there's, like, certain lawlessness to it. Uh, but in Order of the Phoenix... You know, we literally just get Nazis taking over the school. So, like, it's it's all just, like, there's an evil principal and we have to defeat her. Uh, I'm going to teach kids a bunch of illegal magic and have secret club meetings. Yeah, and she's she's also disturbingly evil, you know, literally torturing her students by making them carve words into the backs of their hands and calling them liars. And like, right. And is that sort of like fake, nice, sweet that so many, you know, like it feels like we all have that aunt who's like that. Well, I don't know. Maybe not an aunt, but you know, like you all have that relative who's like that. We all know them. Or you had the one teacher who seemed nice, but really just loved like making you take extra tests or do extra homework or whatever. Um, And like Umbridge is just the most evil version of that possible I, I think aesthetics play into a lot of these and like what makes me think that oh well this is more kids rule than this other thing i think a lot of it is spiky hair yeah i think i think a lot of it is especially in like, live really action. loud colors i think a lot of it is the music you get a lot mm-hmm. of uh, of pop songs like, 90s pop yep and Early especially i heard t- in two different movies I heard the song Come On, Come On by Smash Mouth, yep, which I yep. had forgotten even existed. Oh, I, I do love that song. Um, but yeah, there is a <laughs> Smash Mouth song in two of these. Um, uh, I watched I watched a couple movies that I, I don't think we ended up actually including on this list, but like were of that era that, you know, all had very similar soundtracks and mm-hmm. like kind of similar vibes. Um, so yeah, I think definitely just like capitalizing on like pop music, uh, and, and upbeat pop music in particular, um, and maybe one sad oh, love yeah. song for when the weird romance part happens somewhere in the middle. <laughs> Looking at yeah, you, Snow time. Day. <sighs> Feels like we're we're toning down, but. These movies never did that. They're always no. they're always high energy. High they don't really have like quiet end. moments for the most part. It's all just because they're all bombastic. ninety minutes. They have to squeeze. They do the whole plot in ninety minutes, and it's great. That's true. I loved it. I have never felt more productive than binge watching shit <laughs> for this episode. Like I watched like eight movies in a day, and I was like, I've accomplished so much. Oh God! I mean. Let's talk about because like we're mostly talking about the '90s, but there was some '80s examples on this list. There was Goonies and Ferris Bueller. That was really it. Totally right. Yeah, yeah. but like Goonies and Ferris Bueller, they're a little bit different. First I of mean, all, Ferris yeah. Bueller was cast with like 25 year olds, <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of this like the difference generationally, I think, between the um, the Gen Xers and the Millennials is that like. Even when Gen Xers were seeing kids being revolutionary, they were kind of looking up to them because they were always older. Right. Matthew Broderick was like 25 when he played first Bueller. <laughs> and then as far as Goonies, like, they're fighting pirates. I don't know. That's weird. <laughs> what was up with Goonies, man? Yeah. Um, I mean, we you also get... Hook, but but that's nineties. That's not eighties. It's just like very yeah. Early it's like on 90s. the border. It's like early nineties. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was more just like a dissection of uh, you know Peter Pan narrative. So like yeah, Lost Boys. That's like a kids rule thing. But it's right. usually played for you know like well he has to reclaim Lost Boy like groups. his childhood. You know, is like like he has to stop being a boring lawyer dad. Like it's liar liar basically, but right with magic. Um, right, and also Lost Boys, they always, like, miss their parents. Oh, right. You know? That's, like, right. part of their whole thing, is that they're orphans, which is kind of a wish fulfillment because <laughs> you don't get to have parents, but it's also kind well, of, like... That's the thing, and in punishment. most of these, I would say, like, 
like, I would say the majority of these, the parents aren't necessarily evil. It's, like, other school right. authority figures. And it's, like... Right. Because in, in middle school or whatever, um, middle school story, I don't know, the one with Rafe and his dead brother, yeah. um, you know, like, he loves his mom, and his mom loves him, but he's got a shitty stepdad. An evil stepdad. God, I can't Who has the best the line in the movie, which is, like, they, they call him a butt wipe, and he says, hey, <laughs> a butt wipe feels good. You know who Everyone loves a butt wipe? Loves- Everybody. <laughs> It is a really good line. I I like nodded along at that point. I was like, everyone does love a butt wipe. <laughs> I also like the line from the principal when he says, "Hey, it's not like the ice caps are going anywhere." I was like, that's exactly the point. <laughs> yeah, like there was a reference to global warming in yeah. middle school, the worst years of my life. That's like, true. I mean, that's so much more political than holes, <laughs> which is just like about the luck of the Irish or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> It's not it's about the Jewish. The luck of the Irish. Holtz is mildly political. It's about like black youth. Oh yeah, well being they do have that like camp. subplot about racial discrimination and misogyny mis- mis- or you know interracial yeah. relationships. Oh, mis mis. Oh god, misogyny. Yeah. What however you pronounce it. Yeah. Yeah. It's fucked up. Yeah, like like holes oh holes can get pretty political, but it's like not the same kind of political. I think. Yeah, it's not. Same thing with like Hoot. Like Hoot is Hoot's an environmental movie. Big oil. It's it's environmental, but it's environmental with kids at the at the front of it. And right. it's not, you know, as overtly like understand. this is how you should vote. Yeah. It's the kids are the only ones who understand. Um then there's like weird, weird outliers like like Pokemon, where yeah, all the villains are adults and all the good guys are kids, but it's just too Japanese to be kids. <laughs> It's just too Japanese is it's the problem. It's too Japanese. <laughs> you know, um, ju- like, I, you know, Japanese sort of stories, that they, they do often involve sort of like the kids, you know, have to defer to adults on like major issues. And they only get to fight the adults when it's like they're criminals. Well, I, I don't know. It's interesting because just like, you know, like there's a ton of basic just like adventure narratives where kids are the focus and adults aren't, you know, like that's half of like YA and middle grade literature and like movies in general, you know, um, like it's not about the adults, but that doesn't mean that it's kids rule. You know, it's it's just the protagonist is a child. <laughs> the fact of the matter is in order for kids to rule truly, the parents have to drool. Yep. And in order for kids to rule, they have to win. And so that sort of limits the trope to, you know, kids movies with a very simple goal of we got to prank these adults so hard that they get arrested by police. Or something. <laughs> right. They very often get arrested by police, which yep. sort of defeats the whole purpose or, of, like, the kids taking over. Because it's the... still an adult authority <laughs> figure that, that has the power. Right. Right. Oh, God. I love this trope so much. Guys, I, I'm sure we've missed some of your favorites. Um, and I enjoyed watching most of these so much. So if if we missed one, please tweet at us at Talking Tropes or... Uh, comment in uh the facebook post where you saw this or wherever you're right. listening and and just let us know what what your favorites are cuz this and, is and great. I think you know if we don't do something this trope will die. I mean, middle school the worst years of my life is basically just a copy paste of like all the tropes from these movies mm-hmm. with just a slight twist on them and it did not sell very well. I think no. kids movies largely have been replaced by animation. Um, you know, animation aimed at like a wide range of kids. Right. There's not a lot um, of live so action kids movies anymore. Exactly. You don't really have that many of them anymore. And even within the animation, the 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 framing is usually less kids rule and usually more like let's watch adults and learn to sympathize with them. Right. You know, we have Up, which is you know, yeah, there's a kid <laughs> in it, but it's a story about an old man. Right. Or you know, like Zootopia, which I think <laughs> appealed really well to kids. It's just a cop drama. Like, yeah. Well, or, I mean, like, you know, like Disney stories in general, they're all like teenagers to adults, like the Disney yeah. princesses. So, like, where are the stories about kids just destroying the powers that be, <laughs> just wrecking them with marbles that you throw on the ground and then they slip on the I marbles? Know. 
Did like we what, just what? get too savvy food for fights. that or something? Yeah, like, I mean, food fights just became cliche. But you need like a new. We need a new innovative cliche yeah. to represent revolutionary kids. It can't just be graffiti. It can't just be, and it definitely can't be burning the school down. Right. Um, it definitely cannot be, you know, murdering here's, the adults. Here's my theory: is I, I think there are some of these movies out there. I, I think they might be more like made for Niche. TV movies, and and we're missing them because we're not plugged into like the Disney Channel in that way anymore. Maybe. Um, I feel like most Disney Channel stuff is a lot more aimed at like, you know, it's about teens and their relationships. A lot of them are a lot more surreal. Like there's ones about superheroes now. There's surreal ones, but then there's also like, there's still like slice of life family stuff along the lines of like, like dog McGuire. with a blog, which is about a dog who has a blog. I think yes. that was canceled already. Um, I'm not yes. plugged in. You're right. Um, there there's there's stuff i i'm sure it's out there i just have no clue what it is but i'd be fascinated to find out um i just so, think i just yeah. think like media has gone either like we got to separate it from this revolutionary mindset because we've got to get real or it's gone you know we have to get overtly political there's no more of this just impotent kids kids deserve to be kids kids childhood itself kids just being is, kids god damn it gonna it's, tp your front door it's it's yeah i mean like kids kids like, just being kids what do they value think, they value sweets and I they think, value messes and chaos there's power in that <laughs> We need to seize the power. Yeah. We need to seize the means of production of cookies. Oh, shit. Newsies. We didn't even talk about newsies. Oh, we did not talk about newsies. Newsies 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 is is big time kids rule. And that was a musical set in the 20s. I love it. But, like, it still feels 90s as hell, doesn't it? Well, because it was. It was the fucking it started keanu reeves and like that's what i'm saying 90s. like it was yeah. 90s as all heck despite the fact that it was set in the 20s how do you even do that and i'll tell you how it's because your kids rule kids used to rule they used to rule the streets shit now that we're thinking about musicals like annie annie kind of counts wouldn't you say uh annie was that kids rule or was uh... that more like get adopted by a rich a rich guy and then you're set for life well but it's so that you can have all that like great shit that you want as a kid like yeah i mean it's wish fulfillment i don't know if it's kids rule all right all right i i feel like there are scenes in it that could fall into to this Um, (sighs) annie never pranks the heck out of those guys they they prank uh miss minchin a little bit do they do they prank her by I think they just threatened to put a, a, a Mickey in her drink and send her to the loony bin. Yeah, all right. Fair <laughs> enough. It's been a all it's right. been a minute. It's been a minute since we saw Annie. Maybe next time we'll do it we'll do uh, something about orphanages or orphans. Would, would you yeah. guys like that? Do you do want I, that? Would that You don't want that. Would that work for you? Maybe maybe instead, you know, since we did such a dissect a great dissection of millennial uh culture, maybe next time we'll talk about boomer te- TV. You know, oh why are God. boomers the way they are? Ugh. You guys want to talk about boomers? Let's you guys want us to dissect the boomers? Mash and uh, happy days and Oh happened. yeah, those were the days. The good shit. You know, when when he told you to sit on it, he meant his dick. Oh my god. All right, on that note, um, we'll see you guys next week. Uh, it, it should be an episode of uh, Avatar The Last Korra. I hope you guys are enjoying our uh, our fun new side project. Hey, and um, if you're not, let us know. Message us on, uh, on Twitter at Talking Tropes. Send us a message on Facebook. Uh, you know, get, get in our DMs. Slide into yeah, them. We don't care. Um, you can also support us on Patreon at Talking Tropes. Um, yeah. All right. See you. See you later. Kids. Are-